Okay. Okay, I think we should get started. On behalf of the Center for Chinese Studies at UH Manoa, I would like to welcome everyone to our Fall 2022 CCS webinar series. My name is Yu Ming Bao, Ming Bao Yu from the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures, where I teach 20th century Chinese literature, film, and culture. And I'm currently also serving as the CCS director and the organizer of this year's webinar series with the kind assistance of the CCS Executive Committee and CCS Associate Director Ren Youmei, Dr. Sin Ning. Today's session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, where you can also find previously recorded CCS webinar sessions. Our full program flyer of, uh, for this semester can be found on the CCS website and Instagram, the links of which are now displayed in the chat forum. If you have been following our series this semester, you will have noticed the diversity of interregional and interdisciplinary topics and presentation formats we have featured thus far. And that includes next week's book launch by Dr. Ling Le from UH Manoa Sociology Department, who is the author of The Fruits of Opportunism, Non-Compliance and the Evolution of China's Supplemental Education Industry that was just published by the University of Chicago Press. Today's session is featured as a faculty dialogue on how to read ancient Chinese philosophy that explores the problematics of interpretation and authorship. We are delighted to welcome our two guest speakers, Dr. Tao Jiang and Dr. Esther Klein, and thank CCS faculty and executive committee member, Professor Franklin Perkins from UH Manoa's philosophy department for organizing and moderating today's session and also acknowledge his department for the co-sponsorship. Before I introduce Professor Perkins, who in turn will properly introduce our guest speakers, allow me to go over some procedure reminders. Feel free to use the chat forum for posting any technical or other queries, but use the Q&A for posting comments and questions about today's presentation, which will be answered by our speakers during the Q&A session. In order to accommodate everyone, we kindly ask that you please keep your comments concise and ask no more than two questions, so that we keep within the 30 minutes we have allocated to the Q&A session. We will try to take the questions in the order they have been submitted, but we might also synthesize or group together similar questions so that we save time and make room for other comments and queries. We also reserve the right to dismiss comments and questions that are not relevant or civil in tone. After today's presentation, you will receive a brief, brief survey and we would greatly appreciate your constructive feedback. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague, Dr. Franklin Perkins, who is a, prof who is a professor, professor sorry, of Chinese philosophy at UH Manoa and currently also an active member on the CCS Executive Committee. He has, been, oh, he has also been serving as the longtime editor for the journal Philosophy East and West. And he has written several books, with the most recent one entitled Doing What You Really Want, an introduction to the philosophy of Mengzi that was published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Currently, he's working on a project using recently excavated bamboo texts to analyze for the formation of Laozi's Dao De Jing. So without further ado, I'll turn over to my colleague, Professor Franklin. All right, thank you, Ming Bao. Um, I should probably clarify that I am part of the panel as well, so I'm not just overrunning my time as moderator, uh, but it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today, uh, Tao Zhang and Esther Klein. They're both longtime friends of mine and people that I've learned a lot from, as well as being excellent scholars. So Tao Zhang is a professor of Chinese and Buddhist philosophies at Rutgers University. He's actually the chair of the religion department there and the director of the Center for Chinese Studies. He works on classical Chinese philosophy, Mahayana Buddhism, comparative cross-cultural philosophy. His first book was on Yogacara Buddhism and modern psychology, but his recent book is this uh, Origins of Moral and Political Philosophy in Early China from Oxford University Press. It is a very monumental work uh, that's really a substantial retelling of the history of early Chinese philosophy. And I think it's already started to have a big impact. So Philosophy East and West, the journal that I edit is going to run a discussion of it uh, coming up sometime soon. The starting point really for this discussion today is from Tao's book, uh, because in his introduction, he has a section where he acknowledges the 
sort of historicist arguments coming from sinology about authorship, but then argues for why we should still, as philosophers, read the text as having a kind of unified authorial intention. Uh, so that's the starting point of this of the the idea for the panel. I maybe just quickly mention how Tao and I first met. So we got to know each other at a at a humanities summer NEH summer humanities seminar in Berkeley, which was really a great time. But I first encountered him at a job interview, where I was had a campus interview. I was being interviewed, and I thought it went well. I loved the department. You know, I spent a weekend there. I thought it was all great. And we're driving to the airport with the department chair and the department chair says to me, you know, I just want you to know, everybody thinks you did really great. We really liked you. We'd be happy to have you in the department. But last weekend, we had someone else come who also was really great and everybody liked and we think probably fits a little better. So no decisions have been made, but I just wanted to let you know. And that was Tao and Tao got that job. <laughs> um, so that was that was my first encounter with him. Uh, Okay, so then we also introduced then Esther Sunkyung Klein. She's a senior lecturer at Australia National University. So she is trained as a sinologist and is maybe kind of representing that viewpoint. So she's the author of, of this book, um, Reading Sima Chan from Han to Song, which I think is pretty sinological. But she's done a lot of work, not just kind of the sinological views of Chinese texts, I mean, of philosophical texts, but directly on Chinese philosophy as well. And so she's been particularly working on issues in in epistemology and uh, interesting things with Wang Chong and Han Dynasty philosophy as well. In terms of the relevance here, it's probably the most connection is a very influential article that she published maybe 10 years ago, maybe less than that, called Were There Inner Chapters in the Warring States? A New Examination of Evidence about the Zhuangzi. So that, I just checked, it has over 100 citations, which is really an amazing amount of citations for, it's more it's like quadruple what any article I've published has been cited. It's really a lot of citations and it's become very influential, but Tao takes that as one of his kind of case studies in his introduction on how to read the Zhuangzi. Um, I'll just add Esther, we, we actually met up when we were both fellows on a, a Fulbright in Beijing, and then we were both based in Chicago. And insofar as I have any Sinology qualifications, they're really from Esther. So I've learned a lot from her on the Sinology side for myself. Okay. so. In terms of the formats, um, Tao will start off with a kind of overview of his of his position, uh, about 10 minutes, and then Esther will give her thoughts about these questions that we're looking at for no more than 15 minutes, and then I'll give my reflections, again, no more than 15 minutes, and then we'll go back to Tao, and he'll have about 10 minutes to respond to what we've said, and if there's time, then Esther will give also have a chance to reply, and I might reply, and then we'll move on to general questions from the audience, so we'll make sure that we have at least a half hour of questions from the audience. So by noon, then we'll switch over to taking questions. And with that, so, Tao, you want to start? Let me get the PowerPoint. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. OK, uh, let me see. I can't. Let me, let me at least put this on. OK, um, thank you, Frank, uh, for that lovely introduction, in, in, including our funny history. Um, okay. And uh, let me first thank uh, Center for Chinese, I mean, Center for Chinese Studies at University of Hawaii Manoa for kind invitation and for Frank, uh, for especially for inviting me. And I just feel very honored to, to be on this panel with uh, you, uh, Frank and uh, Esther. Uh, since I've learned so much from both of your works, um, and it's you can see this in in the book that I that that Frank mentioned, uh, Origins of Moral Political Political Philosophy in Early China. So, um, without further ado, let me um, briefly talk about the uh, sort of the introduction uh, to my book, which is I was trying to sort of talk you know to introduce a kind of a methodology to uh, Chinese philosophy, and especially dealing with the challenge that I see, the challenge coming from the Sinologists. Sinology here is primarily sort of the historians of early China. That's, um, so the way I see it, it's, it's a common knowledge that uh, um, Chinese philosophy in Western Academy is caught between these two you know, disciplines. One is Chinese history, or you can say Chinese Sinology, broadly speaking. And uh, your American philosophy, these you know Western philosophy, right? And the uh, so 
most um, most scholars of Chinese philosophy, you know, would have to deal with both Sinology and uh, and Western philosophy in order to sort of uh, find their proper place. And the the challenge coming from Western philosophy uh, on Chinese philosophy is primarily whether the category philosophy fits the Chinese intellectual tradition or not, whether, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether, you know, many of these classical Chinese texts can be really philosophy or maybe just wisdom literature. I mean, so there's a lot of, of you know, sort of challenges in, from that direction. But my focus in the introduction is not on that particular uh, aspect because there has been quite a bit of a study on that. Um, but my focus rather is coming is dealing with the what I call sinological challenges to uh, Chinese philosophy to you know scholars of Chinese philosophy, and particularly the problem of authorship. <clears throat> the problem of authorship is um, is kind of a problem that we we um, sort of it's kind of a, and quite often un under acknowledged or under appreciated its importance in understanding, in, in doing Chinese philosophy, especially when we're dealing with uh, classical Chinese text. And classical Chinese text, these master's texts, you know, um, they are, because of the very long, you know, sort of, it's a very ambiguous and complicated um, sort of textual history, um, which, you know, was likely not the, uh, the, the out of the hands of a single person. It might like be, uh, be a lot of, um, out of hands of, of, of several generations of people. Uh, so, so then there's a lot of heterogeneity um, in a single text, like um, famously, let's say the Analects. So there are a lot of, um, so when, when, when it, whenever we read a text, <clears throat> we might think that we were, what we're trying to do is trying to figure out what the text is saying. Uh, like the Analects, we just, you know, um, open up the text and, and try to figure out the, uh, what the text uh, is, is saying. And, uh, and that seems to be straightforward. But of course, we know that it's, uh, it's never uh, straightforward in that uh, kind of simplistic way, uh, because very quickly uh, we will find that in e even in the second verse, right in the uh, in the in book one, then it's uh, the first uh, verse is uh, is about in Zi Yue, you know, so Confucius said blah, and then the second verse it you know shift to his uh, disciple, one of his disciples, Yu Zi, it says something else. Now, so how do you deal with um, the kind of problem? Do we do we deal with the the, the analex or Lun Yu as a sort of a coherent and cogent text on its own term, or should we actually deal with these different authors that appears in the text, right? You know that, and that we will also sort of find other voices in the text, and this would have very important implications in terms of the philosophical approaches to the text. So. What I'm trying to uh, sort of, what I'm trying to, what I was trying to do in the introduction is to say that it's uh, when we when we scholars deal with um, the these classical texts, um, what we're doing is not simply we're not dealing with um, given objects. We are actually engaged in active construction of scholarly objects, which are often shaped and dictated by various uh, disciplinary norms. So, for example, in you know, Sinology is a primarily a sort of a historical discipline, right? So, in that sense, it's uh, the Sinologists are when they deal with the when they read the text, what they're interested in are primarily the kind of historical questions. And they, in other words, they use, let's say, analytes to try to understand the history behind the text, behind the analytes, its redaction, its uh, transmission, the different kind of personality that's in there, uh, different kind of lineage interest, and the kind of society that uh, produced and transmit this kind of text. Um, so it's a way to understand history. And so, and the, when we when there are conflicts within the text, when there are tensions within the text, then the sinologist tends to use historical methods and in order to sort of say, well, they tend to represent different voices within those texts. So you can say, well, um, the this represents the, the the master, you know, Confucius text, you know, Confucius voice, that those represent, you know, some of his disciples, and they and there is actually uh, they don't always cohere and and so then we will see to study these different uh, these different kind of voices that uh, that was registered and represented and and constructed in uh, and in the in the analects for example so so the so the uh, in that sense the the what 
historians or sinologists in this case, what they're interested in, in the kind of scholarly objects that they construct through the discipline of uh, history is that they're primarily interested in what I call original text, right? So they are very interested in the kind of excavated text since um, that was that gets us closer to what the text was like without these permutations of history. And then they're also interested in the kind of historical author or authors in the, in, in the text. And then uh, because that, that how, that's how they, uh, they really are uh, trying to understand the history behind these texts. And then they will also try to understand this sort of uh, authorial intent or authorial intents that's, uh, uh, that's reflected in these uh, sort of historical documents and, and so forth. So these are the historical objects. Philosophers seems to have a very different kinds of interest. I mean, I, I, I'm drawing a very clear, sharp distinction, but of, of course, uh, often it's not quite as sharply drawn. The distinction, the, 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 the line is not quite as sharply drawn, but I'm just using these ideal kind of, uh, sort of uh, the ideal situation uh, to, to write, trying to draw a sharp uh, distinction to really to try to understand to drive home what's really at stake in terms of our disciplinary objective. So philosophers, um, they tend to be interested in, they tend to be more interested in the conceptual universe that's created by the text itself, right? So, so that's so the so let's say the uh, the analects, so scholars, um, philosophers are interested in the the kind of uh, the key uh, concepts, for example, um, filial piety and its connection with um, um, the concept of Ren or the good or the humanness um, and so forth. Um, and then, so, and, and whether that, th th that's, that, that's the kind of uh, question that the, uh, that the philosophers tend to be interested in. So then in other words, they're much more interested in, in the text as being transmitted through history, right? The analects, as we see, it's transmitted uh, in Chinese history and we know how important that is second to none in, in Chinese history. And then we, uh, the philosophers also, when they try to interpret the text, they construct what I call textual authors. Be um, Textual author is different from historical author. Historical author tend to leave their traces in historical documents. So historians try to, you know, find different traces and try to get a better, you know, better sense of what the what this the historical author is. But textual author is a is a is a sort of interpretive construction by the readers, by the exegetes. Then um, when they try to read the text, that's what we philosophers it just consciously or unconsciously doing that uh, attribute the kind of textual intent to the text, assuming that the text is a coherent and cogent whole. And because their justification is that this has been how it's been, you know, sort of treated historically speaking. I mean, of course there, there's tension within it, but, the, but it's the tension within the uh, sort of the, the conceptual universe uh, of, the, of that particular text. Um, and so this is this is the uh, roughly the difference. What I see the difference between the the scholarly construction of historical and philosophical objects. Um, and then, uh, in the interest of time, I, I I would switch to just briefly talk about this. What I see as three roles um, of sinology uh, in Chinese philosophy. So. The so the scholars who want to do Chinese philosophy, um, they have to engage in sinology, you know, right? They have to know something about Chinese culture, Chinese history, Chinese language, and so forth. Uh, so in that sense, sinology plays the role of a preparer. It prepares the scholar of Chinese philosophy for these other uh, sort of uh, kind of contexts and knowledge. But it also plays the role of a challenger, um, the one that I uh, that, that was the focus uh, of my presentation just now. That's also the focus uh, of my introduction uh, to the book, meaning that it's they use the you know the the concept of let's say authorship to challenge the viability of philosophical interpretation. So the philosophers tend to assume, you know, uh, authorship that you know analects attributed to Confucius. They work on that assumption, but uh, historians or sinologists tends to challenge that assumption. So that's a very different kinds of, uh, of inquiry. But then uh, ironically, uh, sinology, sinology can also play the role of a jailbreaker to scholars of Chinese philosophy. So sometimes when Chinese uh, scholars of Chinese philosophy, when they run into some really challenging kind of problem, 
Um, in Stoker tried to sort of work this out philosophically, and then they appeal to sinological sort of uh, gimmicks um, to say, well, this is not really part of the text, or this is really not part of the, this is not really uh, Confucius uh, sort of position, something like that, for example, to get them out of that. And, and I think that it's, um, again, all of these are, uh, I'm, 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 you know, presenting a very simplistic picture, but it's, uh, I wanted to sort of give a overall uh, understanding of what exactly is at stake in the way uh, that I sketch out uh, the the challenges uh, and the differences between uh, historical uh, and uh, philosophical approach to Chinese classical text. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Tao. Um, Esther, you want to give your comments and thoughts? Yes, thank you very much um, for having me and. Also, thank you, Tao, for raising all these really um, fascinating questions. Um, I guess I want to start by saying, you know, I, I read the introduction to, to your book and uh, Tao, and I felt like I was in agreement, perhaps surprising, like in agreement with a lot of the things that you were um, that you were trying to do with it. For example, the idea of constructed textual authors, which you touched on here as well. Um, I think that that's that's a kind of valiant project. It's it's a project that I you know I've occasionally attempted as well for for other kinds of texts, and I guess I don't think of it as a sort of I, how would I say it? Like there's a sinological way of doing that project as well. So when you talk about constructed textual authors, I feel like you're not avoiding sinology. You're doing sinology um, in some sense. Um, I, I do think that I should address the kind of sinologist in the role as challenger, in the role of challenger, um, which did come through very clearly. This sense of, um, you know, this kind of emotional or institutional sense of sinologists and philosophers fighting or like being at odds. And I've, I've certainly seen that play out um, in, in various ways, but, uh, but I don't like I kind of I would hope that we don't have to be that way. <laughs> Um, and that, you know, we, there is a more constructive manner of engagement. Um, but I, because this is a discussion, not about that, but about authorship in, in Chinese philosophy and these issues, I guess my, the, my perspective on that would be certainly when I was coming up through uh, graduate school and so on, there was this sinological obsession with authorship, authenticity, dating of texts. And I, and I think I've come to a way of conceptualizing that as, as a kind of a foundational and incomplete work in the service of some bigger goals. And I think you you actually acknowledge that in your book and say like, you know, okay, this is, we have these goals of like, and, but I kind of want to put it in a different way. Um, one way I guess I would put it is uh, one of one of the big goals again from my time that's changed now I think but from from my time as in training was to try to figure out you know the warring states you you take the warring states as being this um, foundational original period of Chinese philosophy right the birth the birthplace of Chinese philosophy actually I, I won't use my PowerPoint too much because I you know I don't want to um, but I will just for a minute. Like this, so this is a page from from your book, like what, one of the more productive pages for me. Um, so you sort of take the, the warring states as an origin point, talking about the flourishing, the various masters and the hundred schools. And I feel that this is a, a thing that many or many Chinese philosophers do um, is kind of focus on this warring states period. And I think the kind of corrective impulse of sinologists has been to feel concerned about that. Um, and part of the concern is that is this kind of process that you actually talk about in your book, this um, prolonged, complex, complex, opaque process of formulation, contestation, reformulation, transcriptions, canonization, reaction, and transmissions. I love this description, right? I think that's exactly what has been happening with Warring States philosophical texts. Um, the, the, and the only place I disagree with you on that is how long it took, right? You say several generations. I say, you know, a sinologist will say maybe twice that, maybe three times that, right? So the idea that the process was more prolonged than traditional accounts will tend to acknowledge. 
um, and that it extended at least through the Qin and Han. Like that's kind of, that's a synological kind of corrective, I would say. And so on the one hand, I can totally understand wanting to limit the objects of study to um, the warring states. It's a smaller canon. It's, you know, you don't have to kind of get, uh, how to put it, like, tied up in the oppressive issue of empire, which, you know, I find it very tedious and oppressive too, like it's sort of problem with studying the Han. And I think it's fine. Like the, there are many texts, you know, that kind of, that are authentically, probably authentically warring states texts. And it, I'm not even sure it matters if they're authentically warring states texts, right? For, for doing philosophy. Um, but if, but, but, but on the other hand, right? There are certain types of projects for which this is really problematic. And one type of project is actually if you construct a textual author, if you say, you know, I'm going to construct it like a figure of the author that comes out of this text. Um, I think that actually muddies the water for the historical side of your argument, like the history of Chinese philosophy as told. Um, and it becomes a kind of a, I won't say this in a bad way, like a pseudo history, right? Or a, or a kind of a just so story almost. Like it's like, it's it's not, so, so history isn't the word I would use, but it's still a really valuable project. So I don't say that in a negative way, or it's like a counterfactual history or something. It, this might've been how it, this could have been how it was. Um, and I've seen, you know, some, some great philosophers do that brilliantly, right? So, so I'm not saying it's a bad project at all. Um, but I guess my own perspective on this would be that the idea of authorship, including textual author, right, including um, authorship attribution, because what when textual author, you construct a textual author, you say, okay, this text has come together, and I'm going to imagine the philosopher that was the author of this text, or I'm going to say, like, the text is a person, right, <laughs> um, and, and what would that person be like? Uh, and if those texts came together in the Han period or the Qin period, that person is like, it's got a lot of Han in their DNA, right? <laughs> There's a lot of Han in them. And, and for some projects, I do not think that matters. It only matters if you get into the history game. It only matters if you're, you know, telling, you know, this thing happened one after another, right? Um, and, you know, again, as a recovering sinologist, I'll, I'll sort of, you know, lapse back into my, my old ways for a moment and just kind of talk about for a second what I think the picture of the textual culture most likely was based on current evidence, like textual culture of warring states, right? And the, the thing that is most strikingly relevant to this conversation is that in the, in the words of, of 18th century uh, essayist, philosopher, historian, Zhang Shui Cheng, Yang Gong, words were held in common. Words were not privately owned, right? So the idea of words being privately owned only grows slowly over time. And even in the Han, it's not completely there. I mean, Zhang Shui Cheng is still, I think, he's, he doesn't draw the line with Han. <laughs> he's a sort of almost like, if this is my own time, that's all bad, right? Um, but he has lots of good evidence for, he has written a whole essay on this, this is horrifically complex, um, but, but I'm like working my way through it now. Um, he has lots of good evidence that, and there were uh, from independent sources too, from excavated texts. What we see in the Warring States is not big, like compilations with one person's name on it. We see little scraps of things that get combined and recombined. And it, the, 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 the desire to make big compilations in the Han appears to happen where through a process where you take a master and some texts kind of coalesce around them, sort of like you know, seed crystal growing a crystal, right? You get this kind of text that, oh, that seems to fit and that seems to fit. And so in the beginning, the master is not an author figure. He's the character in his own text. He's the character, he's like, he's like a character and there are other characters. And, um, and then gradually we come to read him as having like an authority and a sort of philosophical of 
authority rule within that text. And I mean, I know the, you, you know all this, but but you know, just in case other people don't, you just kind of as as a kind of background, right? Um, and so I guess this has some implications for how we do some kinds of projects. Now, personally, just in terms of what I what I want to do with philosophy, I really would like us to get away from focusing overly much on categorizing thought by these masters. Like, I think if we care about the warring states, we should be willing to admit that texts were flowing around all over the place. And that's kind of a very insecure feeling. We have to teach differently. Like I've experimented on my poor undergraduates by teaching not by text, right? But like by issue, right? So like, I'm like, let's look at all, but all the different perspectives on this issue are. Um, not worrying too much about the origins, right? So radically dehistoricizing, like, you know, I'm like gone completely the other way. Um, and it's interesting, like it has limitations too, but it, but I think it's possible to do philosophy that way. Um, it just, it's not an intellectual history type. If we're gonna do intellectual history type philosophy or, you know, history of philosophy or something, I think it's really important to acknowledge the textual culture of warring states, the textual culture, like what it looked like and that it didn't look like these canonized um, chunks of text. But if we want to talk about those, and I think it's very valid and interesting to talk about big canonical influential texts, like we we do that, I do that, like I think it's more interesting to do that than talk about excavated text. Um, but then we have to kind of cope with some things about the Han, about the conditions under which they come together. Or we don't care about when they come together and we just like you look at look at the um look at what the the overall text produces. I think that's a great project. I'm just not sure that we can write a history of Chinese philosophy from that project. Um, so that's about what I have to say. Um thanks again for uh, my my sort of patience with my off-the-cuff remarks, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Frank. All right. Well, so first, thank you both for those comments. And I, I say I organized this panel. I suggested the panel because I'm really unsure how to deal with these issues. And my students who are here know that. Like, I, I generally tell them to follow Tao's model. Um, but myself, I don't necessarily follow that model, but I'm not even sure what to do. So these are open questions. So I just have a couple kind of points I want to make just that I'm, I'm not sure of, right? But so roughly it divides into two parts. So one would be um, siding with Tao on this idea of needing a textual author, but questioning the justification for it. And in particular questioning whether the degree to which that depends on the tradition. The second one then would be to kind of argue in the opposite direction that I think philosophy is not as threatened by breaking down this kind of authorship as Tao sometimes presents it. So at one point, Tao, you say that it threatens the very viability and integrity of the philosophical approach. So I want to say we don't need to be so afraid of that method if it's used in moderation, I think, is, is what I want to argue, though. So I think to me in thinking about these things, the basic dilemma, I think, is this. So as philosophers, we are, I think, primarily concerned with philosophical significance and how you say it's present as concerns. And I think that's not just in what we do with the text, but it's a factor in how we interpret the text, right? So we interpret the text so that they say something more philosophically interesting than otherwise. And I agree with you that this is bound up with the tradition of authorship. And you explain this very well, but just for people who haven't read the book, I mean, th the main way I think that you discover new ideas is you find two things that in your thinking don't go together. And then you have to think, well, why would someone say both of these, right? And that forces you to think something different from your initial presuppositions. And that's how you learn something, right? And I think if we just, in every time we meet something that doesn't, every time we encounter something that doesn't meet our expectations, we say, well, okay, that's because two different people wrote this. It just makes the text boring, right? I think boring philosophically, but I would even say just boring, boring, right? On the other hand, right, if we're claiming to do Chinese philosophy, it seems like we can't just be making stuff up, right? Even if it's philosophically interesting, it seems like we have some accountability to the actual historical reality. And how to sort that out is the problem. So the problem is if the historical reality is that when you have conflicting passages, it's a good chance that they actually were written by multiple people. Then it seems like when we try to read it as if it's written by one person, we are just making stuff up, 
And the question is, how do we justify that? Or how do we not describe it as making stuff up, right? How do we give a different kind of account of it? So I think, and I may be misunderstanding your point from our email exchange earlier, I thought maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but I think that your answer is heavily dependent on appeal to a tradition of reading the text in that particular way. So this comes out most strongly in your contrast between original text and inherited text. And so you say, inherited classics are invaluable to philosophers because it is they that have exerted influence on the tradition under study, not the original classics. Um, and so you read Justifying Lao Tzu. So you, you pretty much, I think, acknowledge that the Lao Tzu is probably written by multiple people over time, but justify reading it as a whole because it's been read that way since you know the second century BC and because it's that way that it's had this influence over the Chinese tradition. So I think you, one could say that this, you are giving the textual author a historical basis, but the historical basis isn't like some original guy who wrote it. The historical basis is the tradition of reading it that way, right? So I think though I have two problems with this. I'm not sure that I disagree, but two problems with it. So the first is that the way philosophers read the text, I think doesn't actually align that closely with those traditions. So the clearest example is that the Lao Tzu was pretty much always read as the first Chinese philosophical text, right? So written, you know, he's senior to Confucius, but roughly the same time. It's usually been read through commentaries that weren't really clearly distinguished from them. And very few modern Western readers do that. So some Chinese readers still do that, you know, but modern Western readers, I think, rarely do that. And you yourself place Lao Tzu closer to Meng Tzu and don't really talk about the commentaries, that kind of thing, as I would neither. But then I think our textual author isn't really the textual author of the tradition. I mean, the textual author of the tradition was this guy who lived before Confucius, you know, and that's the context of it. And that our inherited text isn't really, our text isn't really that inherited text anymore. And maybe a, a point closer to home, and I'm not as sure that this is even correct, but I think that reading the Zhuangzi in terms of the inner chapters rather than the whole book is a, is a modern view, right? I mean, certainly Guo Shang, his interpretation he depends heavily on him using stuff from like the primitivist chapters to interpret the inner chapters. His use of the concept of Xing never appears in the inner chapters, even though it's one of his most fundamental concepts in interpreting it. So that's my first reluctance with it. The second one is, is more basic, which is that I, I think in reality, it's very few philosophers read the text this way because that's the tradition. So that sounds more like a rationalization and not really the reason why we do this. Uh, and so I think that the, the, maybe tradition doesn't get to the issue quite closely enough. And that maybe we better think of a slightly, I mean, a similar concept, but slightly distinct one of what Gadamer calls reception history. So this is just the idea that anytime we encounter a text, we never read the text itself. We're always reading it in a context of expectations that come from previous interpretations that we're familiar with. And I think for us, for us, us, it's maybe too broad. For me, that isn't, you know, how these texts were read in the Tang Dynasty or something like that. That for me really is AC Graham, right? And AC Graham's building on Feng Yulan and Hu Shu and Wing Si Chan. Like it's a modern tradition that's setting that context, I think. But I think thinking about it in terms of reception history, it gets that fact that I think really that's the background that we're reading the text in is this modern one. But also I think maybe gets better at what actually matters philosophically, which I think is not that these are traditional, but that there's a consensus around them. And this I think is another difference between philosophy and other disciplines that you can really only do philosophy with other people who can argue against you and, and develop the ideas. It's very hard to do interesting philosophy by yourself. But you can only do that if there's already a consensus on the text. And anybody doing philosophy has encountered this, even in modern things. You know, if you, you make some objection to Kant that's meant to be philosophical and the person replies like, yeah, but in his lecture that he gave when he was 54 years old, he actually says this. And it's like, all right, well, the end of that, end of that discussion, you know, you need some consensus on it. And I think that's the opposite of the trajectory of, of synology, which where there's always a push to talk about something no one else has talked about. Right, philosophy kind of has the opposite tendency to join in the conversation that's already going, and it's very hard to get started on the excavated text, say, right, because there's no one else who's talking about them philosophically. So this, I mean, it's pretty similar, I think, to what you're saying, but the question then would be, well, how do we justify that reception history, especially if it seems to go against the actual historical facts? And so I think it can be justified, but it's not going to be the same way that we justify it by appealing to the the, the sort of indigenous Chinese tradition of reading the text. So I think it opens up different questions that have to get sorted out. 
Okay, so that's the first point I wanted to make. I want to make sure I don't use too much time. Uh, let me turn then to the second point about splitting up the text. And I, I my basic idea is that I think reading them philosophically depends on there being some authorial unity, but not necessarily the same level of unity that, that our reception history has. So I think we could break up the text more and that will change the actual interpretations we now have, but wouldn't eliminate the possibility of reading them philosophically. And I think maybe the easiest way to illustrate that is to think about the Zhuangzi, because I think almost all modern philosophers accept that that really contains three or four different philosophies, right? So you've got the inner chapters, stuff similar to inner chapters, you've got the primitivist, you've got the synchronous Huang Lao stuff. So why is that better? Why is it better to read the Zhuangzi as actually having say three or four textual authors instead of one textual author? And I have three reasons for that. So just briefly, the, the simple one is that on the surface, I think having more philosophies is better than having less. So if you read the Zhuangzi as one whole, there's just one philosophy there. And if you read it as really kind of four texts, let's say, then you have four interesting philosophies to play with and to explore. Now, I think if you read it as a thousand philosophies, you would actually have no interesting philosophies because they would all be too brief to really do anything, right? But I don't think there'd be a problem with say having a dozen, you know, I'm not sure at what point it would get too many, right? But I think you could break it into somewhat smaller pieces and it would still be good philosophy. And if that's all true, then I don't see why we couldn't read the Laozi as say three philosophies in the same way that we read the Zhuangzi as three philosophies, right? So it would change our reading of the Laozi, but would still, I think, allow for philosophy. The second point I wanna make is um, more complicated and maybe more biased for my own views of philosophy. But the thing that bothers me the most with reading texts coherently is that I think it always undermines the more radical position. So if we read the whole Zhuangzi as one, right? The problem with that is that the Huang Lao parts are far more accepting of Confucian values and of politics than the inner chapters. And if we're gonna read them as having one author, then really you get the Huang Lao chapters because they're already syncretist. Like they've already unified both of those things. And you lose the more radical philosophy of the inner chapters, which I just think can't be kept if you're gonna read it as the same perspective as the Huang Lao chapters have. But I think you could make the same argument about the inner chapters then. So almost everything in the inner chapters has a pretty radical position that you should not get involved in politics and that you actually should like make yourself incompetent so that no one will like force you to become department chair, right? So the, you, you free yourself from these structures by your sheer in, incompetence at anything that would be useful to anyone. But there's one passage, right? That clearly rejects that and says that it's our, you know, it's unavoidable fate that you have to serve the sovereign. It's really just one place that says that. There's a few places that might imply that as well. So if we read that together, you lose the radical view, right? I mean, if you read it all together, that author has to think that it is sometimes necessary to take political office and you shouldn't just always try to avoid political office. And that that could be good philosophically. Like it requires some creativity in how to mix those together. We try to think how do these fit? There's a lot of open space for interpretation, but there's some loss I think in losing that more radical view. Another example I think would be on emotions. So I think there's passages in the inner chapters that advocate an ideal of being free of emotions. But there's definitely some passages that suggest you would have some emotions, but in some kind of maybe detached way or some kind of moderate way. And historically, you know, it's, there's a good case that these were written by different people, and that's why they have different views on that. But if we read them as one textual author, I think you have to end up with a more moderate view. Um, that's the only way to really reconcile those together, right? So that's the second point. And this is maybe just my preference for more radical extreme philosophy. So someone could say that this moderating influence is actually good because what we want is more moderate synchronous philosophies. The third one also is definitely on my own philosophical biases. So uh, I, I, I personally often think it's more interesting to examine tensions rather than solutions. So when we read the text as a whole, we tend to minimize those tensions. And, and really, as you describe it, the function of the textual author is when we find tensions to figure out how they actually fit together. Whereas if we allow it that the text is multiple, then we can you know, follow those tensions because we can say what's going on in the inner chapters is a debate about emotions or a debate about taking office or not rather than one position on taking office. Uh, yeah, so for the sake of time, I think I will 
Well, I'll just say what's interesting is that at least in your reading of Mengzi, you actually read him as much more conflicted than most people do. Um, and that's interesting, right? Um, but it seems almost like you're falling short of your method there because it's actually easy to reconcile all the passages of Mengzi. Even I'm open to, to dividing up text and I read it all as coherent. Um, and it seems like you're 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 reading it as less coherence, right? And uh, I'll just I'll leave it at that because I do want to make sure that you have your ten minutes before we reach noon at least. Um, so yeah, those are just some ideas to think about. So tell you can respond to whatever you want out of what Esther and I said, or you know, <laughs> other things that you've thought of while we were talking or anything. Um, yes, thank you. So these these are just such um, such thoughtful. Um, questions and and thought and, and and a lot of it is you know that I, I that I have thought about and, and a lot of it is you know pushing uh in in in, in different directions which you know, which is very which is very helpful um so the um Esther question about oh question you know essentially about the role of the Han you know sort of it's like when does these classics you know becomes classics and when would they sort of the canon close or when they become sort of finalized and become when do the analogs actually become analogs and and and, and or or, or, you know, or in drones it might even be later and, and so for all we know um so all, so and these are these are really really important questions and it's you know it's it's also a really tough question to 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 incorporate into into um sort of the if you want to sort of tell the story of the of the of the philosophy side of the of that it's so the, so you know you, you you sort of mentioned that i i do sort of do the uh, sort of take care of the sinology part which i devote a significant part of the book towards because i want i want to be br bridge builders right you know i want i don't want to be the one to fall through the cracks right you know as most people would would end up doing sort of because philosophers when they read the the classical chinese you know read the, read the chinese philosophy they thought okay it's just too much sinology and then sinologists think that's just not enough sinology and so so i mean it's you know you, you just can't win on, on, on that and so i wanted to be able to find a way to to accommodate both uh, interest with the with the sense that because ultimately my goal my goal is to study the ideas in those texts right that I that I wanted the sort of the sinological discourse to be helpful to understand the the ideas the conceptual universe that's creation of the text rather than ex explaining the tensions away right which in ties into uh, what Frank was talking about sort of the uh, the saying that it's um that that it would you know the uh, the tensions and conflicts are are actually valuable i love that i mean that that's precisely uh, what uh drives me you know as a thinker sort of that as a scholar that i that i sort of privilege in some ways the the, the these kind of tensions um within the text also between text um and because that's the that for me is the way that philosophy is really developed and, and we see this very clearly in the in 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 the classical period in the way that i that i understand the uh, you know the uh, the trajectories and, and so forth so so um and then I, i'm just gonna just talk back and forth you know without following the orders of the of, of, of the of your questions so whether whether sort of whether assuming that this a text let's say Zhuangzi or the men or mengzi um assume that it was the sort of the textual author of the Mengzi and the Zhuangzi would compromise or underlines the you know, undermines the radical some of the more radical uh, ideas or the or, or undermines the, the you know the the sort of the conflicts the tensions within the text. Um, so wouldn't we be better off to just split up the text so then we can have we can let these sort of you know conflicting voices to you know to just uh, go on their own their own without having to force them into having to you know, like deal with each other i mean this is probably more of the case in the in the in drones as you as you outlined um i i what worries me about splitting up these texts um i think i, I also mentioned to you is um is the fragmentation of of the conceptual universe and it's sort of it's uh, i almost take it as that there's almost some reason for these texts to be put together in the way that they, they were put together so i didn't take that as completely accidental that people just feel you know sort of and randomly just put together and then therefore and and acknowledged uh, as such and then and therefore just uh, uh if they just put the wrong ideas together and then the tradition just suck it up you know so i i just i I don't want to 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 read it in that way. I wanted to 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 defer to the tradition in the sense that it's that there there, there are reasons for for the for those uh, texts to be to 
to be put together right under the umbrella. And of course, the transit was interesting because it, you know it was you know assuming this is Guoxiang's division that it's you know divide, divide this into the inner and um, outer and the miscellaneous and and and, and so forth. Um, and and even so so then even within him that he realized that there there's some there there's some divergent voices that are there are differences and uh, and then uh, the contemporary scholars obviously we can disagree on on, on certain divisions. But then it's but then it's as long as long as we, if you know, most of us sort of focus on the on the inner chapters, even though many of the other chapters or miscellaneous chapters are actually really, really, really fascinating and sort of understudied. But it's um, but if I if I just simply just use the defer to the inner chapter as the you know as uh, as the core, even though I know the the Esther is you know question that um, on very on very good ground, and I think there it's it's still it's you know we we can still maintain. The sort of the radical aspect of all of the all of the Drones's ideas, um, without having to reconcile them, right? It's you know, and 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 it's for me the value is precisely that these conflicts are housed in in the same text, in the single text, uh, and and I and and I, that for me is really valuable. And I don't, I mean, just like when when I was doing Mengzi. and I think there are these what I call the the, the sort of the extensionist mentions. Uh, what I call that, that's the normative mentions and the sacrificialist mentions, which is the, what I call the radical mentions. And I don't think um, for him, these two strands or actually, uh, you know, can be reconciled under a lot of circumstances. I mean, some of it can be reconciled, but but a lot of it really cannot be reconciled. And so something has to give. So then that's the sort of the, the, sac the sacrificialist aspect of the, uh, of the teaching. And it's so, so I think there is a way to accommodate these um, conflicts within, the t within that text without having to then split them up into, into different fragments. Because I, I'm, I'm worried about um, the, uh, the, the, first of all, fragmentation of the different conceptual universe. And also sort of it's, I, I guess I'm just maybe I'm just deferring too much to the to the tradition in the way that these texts um, were sort of put together um, in 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 the particular way that they that they have been and that has been sort of commented on and and transmitted in that particular sort of fashion and 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 also splitting up um, sometimes I, I I also worry um, unless we can have really good access to the more sort of to like you know more excavated texts that clearly sort of tell us about these different portions of these texts and that that were coming from different you know from different places um and that are not directly related and then i feel more comfortable in putting them in you know in splitting splitting up otherwise mm, i i would rather sort of put them together otherwise and in the way that the that the tradition uh, have been. Otherwise, I, I'm I'm worried about sort of you know. Then we'll be building on sort of the, the sort of the speculation upon speculation upon speculation. Um, the because I, I it's hard to think what the the limiting condition will be. Sort of what will limit that splitting up, right? And so we can say it's three or five, and but then it's you know. But then uh, what's to prevent others to split up even more? That you know, that once we open that up, I, I I just don't see how that can end. Then we then we will analyze it into something that's really really boring, you know. So then it will be like they all ideas will be completely coherent, and uh, they will be it will be not uh, there would not be any tension. That as you said, that will be just boring. Any at least from my perspective. Anyway, that 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 will be that will be one thing. And I, I think that the question that you that you talk about, I think it's a it's a really interesting question that Frank talks about the sort of the, the justification of textual author, um, you know, sort of the the the, the way that um, the what, what is the tr what is the tradition that I that I that I was talking about that I seem to be appeal appealing to that I was appealing to exactly the tradition of reading these texts as coherent as you know as a sort of a unitary kind of a text without sort of being uh, sort of fragmented into into you know into uh, into different parts that are unrelated. I mean, it's not specific to a sort of a particular commentarial tradition, but rather in the way in the way that the texts are read. And I mentioned in the in the book that it's in some ways I almost see you know sort of our a lot of the contemporary scholars of Chinese philosophy is doing a kind of what Zhu Xi is doing, you know, sort of in the in in the in the Song Dynasty as a, as a providing a kind of commentary on on the tradition, but then under very very different kind of context, right? Because we have 
a lot more access to the excavated text, and we have also have um, have a we have to deal with the sort of the the, the kind of material and institutional arrangement uh, in a modern academy and then you know situated let's say in the West. So then we are dealing with the global you know context and the dealing with challenges from 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 Western philosophy and so forth. So so then we are so we we are dealing with the kind of providing a new kind of commentary um, on these texts. Um, within this kinds of uh, within these kinds of different uh, you know um, intellectual and uh, material conditions uh, and you know so that that's very different from the uh, the pre modern but in but still in the sense that that um, that these um, classical these uh, sort of pre modern commentaries the the way that they they sort of treat the the text as um, as as in some ways unitary itself. Is the way that I that I, it's 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 the tradition that I that I appeal to, not necessarily the the specific commentary tradition, but just that they they treat the text. They seem to assume a textual author. They seem to assume the 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 the, the inherited text. They seem to assume the sort of the the textual attention, te, you know, te, and textual intent. That 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 was uh, that was uh, what I was trying to do. And 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 lastly, the particularly the the, the question about. Um, Laozi, that's a really, really interesting question um, because we know traditionally that uh, the Tao Te Ching was placed uh, much earlier than the sort of Western sinological discourse. This is where sinology really makes a huge difference, right? It's a uh, Western sinology has, you know, proved at least to, in my mind, convincingly and you know, conclusively that um, the Tao Te Ching is a much later text than the Analects. Um, and uh, the and it you know and it, it just just the study the the conceptual universe and the kind of cosmology or cosmogony that's that uh, that's in the Tao Te Ching it's it just uh, the it's it reflects a very very different kind of ethos from from the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 world of the Analects. Uh, but then it's so in that in that sense it's not traditional in the sense that it didn't follow the traditional sequence, but it's traditional in the sense that I read this as a as a as a whole text right as a as a, as a text text under its own, not uh, not sort of uh, put them in, in separate ways, even though I would then uh, sort of uh, chronologically, I will place it uh, much later than than the analects. So so that so so again, the, the tradition that I appeal to as the justification of my methodology is not is not the tradition of the, you know, it's not the commentary tradition, you know, in its specific comments, but rather in the way that they approach the text as, a, you know, as a unit as a, a kind of a unitary uh, whole. And, and that that's basically the you know the the my approach. So I think. Okay. okay. Wow. This is so fascinating. We could go on for hours, but we actually have a number of very long and specific questions, and of course, I think the audience is dying to hear your answers. I think some of some of it may, may already been answered by Professor Jiang just now, but um, let's let's take them in the order they have submitted. The first question is a very broad and general one for all three of you. It comes from James Co uh, James Cochran, and it says, "What." Uh, for each presenter, what do you see as the greatest shortcoming in your field? And remember, we have six more questions that are much longer and very specific. So this is a very broad question. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to answer that one first. If, yes, if I take my field to be synology, I think some of the shortcomings have already been brought out uh, well, but one that hasn't, I mean, the boringness problem, the, you know, but, but one that hasn't is, I think, factionalism. So I think people are less interested in talking to each other and collaborating. I, I'm aware that I'm saying this publicly on YouTube, but <laughs> but I do feel like this this does make the field somewhat of a less friendly place than I've found philosophy at times. I mean, there are obviously factions that get along with each other, but also there's a lot of kind of nastiness, which I which is not very productive. I think. Mm -hmm. Frank. Or I think we have no flaws in it. It's it's a very flourishing field. It's great. Uh, we're just doing wonderfully. Yeah. So so we we just need more people. That's that's why. And we don't have enough people to do to philosophy. And we just need more. You know, in philosophy departments open up more positions. You know, hire more people, and then we'll 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 even we'll even do better. Um. So that I think I th yeah I think that's uh, that that's the the sort of at least on on the philosophy side of things. And sort of like you know, University of Hawaii is one of those very few places that actually have you know like you know several um sort of specialists on, on chinese but and on western philosophy that's uh, that's really not the norm by a long stretch yeah so yeah i think i would kind of agree with tao actually that chinese philosophy is doing very well now like it's a lot more people a lot more different approaches to things 
it's growing very quickly. Uh, so it's hard to point out weakness just because there's so many different ways that people are doing it. You know, I, I think one weakness is the disconnect from what's going on in the Cinephone world. You know, so 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 connecting with what Chinese scholars are doing and also with the, with the tradition, with commentaries, that kind of thing. But even that, there's a lot of change, I think, happening with that kind of thing. But I maybe mean, we would point that out as a weakness. But I think the field's doing pretty well at the moment, actually. Okay, great. Let's go to the next question. And actually, our audience can see it now in the chat forum. It's from Bobby McCullough. It says, in the context of giving current philosophy graduate students advice for future publication, what would be the advice you would give on when we should engage with the authorial issues of classical Chinese text? Or put it differently, which sorts of appro approaches in a philosophical paper would necessitate taking a position on the authorial issue in the paper? Right. And the question is now typed in the chat forum. And so this is all three of you. Anyone? <laughs> well, Frank is the editor, so. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say so Bobby's a PhD student here, so he gets my view all the time. What do what do the two of you think on this? Top question? advice I would give do do not reinvent the wheel. Like, don't force yourself to, like, learn everything about the authorship controversy about something. Read some stuff, cite some stuff briefly. I mean, Frank pointed out like Mike Drogs of Paper has like 100 citations, right? How many of those are citing it to disagree? At least half, probably three quarters, right? <laughs> but you can still cite it to disagree. You can say, ah, some people have this position, like here's one, you know, and just try to be involved with the secondary literature to the extent that you don't have to do all the work yourself. Um, that would be my top advice. And like when yeah. you have to engage you, you, then you have to decide how much it matters to you because you've read it. <laughs> Right. I mean, I, I agree in, in exactly that it's you, ha you have to decide what um, what relevance that topic has to your project. It's, you know, sort of so it's uh, you, you first have to decide what exactly are you doing and, and what it is that what's the point that you are trying to do? What's where do we where do you want to get to and whether that discussion is integral to your uh, to your project at all or not? I mean, just, I wouldn't force on it. If it doesn't really have any bearing, then uh, I would just mention it, uh, maybe put it in footnotes, and, and then I wouldn't necessarily impact the the you know the the flow of the, uh, of the of the paper. So I wouldn't just do it for the sake of doing it. It has to be sort of integral to your project. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I I also agree that it's uh, it's uh, it's important to engage in secondary scholarship. I think as especially as philosophers, uh, we probably do not engage in secondary scholarship enough. Um, and uh, and and then that 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 can that can so there, um, then the, the, you know the the. the the, the kind of the appearance of constantly reinventing, reinventing the wheel is is not a great impression to have yet. Mm -hmm. Frank, you don't you want to pass? Well, so yeah, I would just say that I think we're at a point where reading with a lot of the texts, you can be justified in reading them different ways. And there's people who are reading them in different ways. And following Esther's point, like I wouldn't try it in a new way if you're just starting out. But find someone who's reading it the way that you are, you know. So I think Chris Fraser has articulated sort of ways of reading, particularly the Zhuangzi, that's not assuming any kind of overall unity to different sections. So if you're wondering, like if you're if whatever research is taking you that direction, you could follow him as a model. I think Tao very clearly articulates the, the sort of other side of reading it as a whole. You can follow that model. I think with most of the texts, you can follow different models, you know. But I would find some precedent for it. So if, if you're starting out, not try a new one, you know, but, but that there are multiple ways to do it, depending on what your interpretation is. You know, I mean, if, if your interpretation is something that fits the text as a whole, then I would say, just take that approach. Right. But if you're differing from that, I think that can be justified too, but you want to find other people who are doing that already. Great. The next question, which you can now see in the chat forum is from Rem T and this relates to translation. And I think it's sort of following up on the earlier question a little bit, what could be the implication of the contrast of historical versus philosoph philosophical perspectives on the translation of the ancient classics. Primarily, since after so many translations, uh, sin uh, primarily, since after so many translations of varying degrees, do they all need correcting, even those written by earlier scholars? I remember in the case of Tao De Jing, which has been translated into so many different versions, that many of them differ altogether. <laughs> 
And yet they still have philosophical impact on their readers. How can these contradictions be reconciled? Tal, you want to start with that? Um, um, so yeah, this is actually a really interesting question. So I mean, I think, I think the, um, it probably depends on, on whether you're a professional translator, right? You know, you, you approach it differently. And whether you are a philosopher, then you, uh, we, we, you know, sort of, it's inter sort of translation is always interpretation, right? I mean, that's, I think that's, that's the, that's the sort of the, uh, the considered to be common sense that it's, um, that I think philosophical approach, uh, what's valuable to me um, is precisely to, not necessary to accept to to use a sort of a you know a standard a standardized uh, translation already especially on these core concepts because quite often it's important to understand the, uh, the sort of the the different different shades you know different sort of dimensions in these core concepts and then you actually need to provide a new uh, a new uh, tr translation that would so that you can hand your interpretation on on that ground. So, for I'll, I'll give you an example in my uh, chapter on the Analects, um, the I translate Ren. This is everybody understand. This is to, to be the you know the usually translated as the good or as humaneness or or sometimes as um, um, as the human kindness and the humanity or or, or, or so on and, and sometimes even as uh, benevolence and so forth. But um, I sort of end up translating it as uh, as you know using the humaneness come justice um as the translation because i wanted to make the point that this sets the agenda for later development of of the of chinese philosophy uh that that mozi or the moist takes the uh, takes the justice direction the impartialist justice di direction and Mencius takes the partialist humaneness direction. So, and whereas I see it in Confucius formulation of Ren, that both dimensions are present. So I sort of ended up not accepting any of the standard translation. I ended up using a different translation so that I can, that can help me make the case uh, for the book. So, I mean, you know, uh, other people would, would probably adopt a very different kind of, uh, of translation. Uh, Dr. Klein? No. Right. I, I, my Zoom cut out and I missed the question, but I had read it earlier. Um, um, but I mean, I guess I would say if we're talking about how you translate things in your work, um, I would kind of agree with Tao that it's really important to go through and try your own translation. Although I'm a big fan of if, if, you, if there's a published translation that you agree with, Again, not reinventing the wheel because some there are some published translations that are quite beautiful. So I will tend to use the published translation until I disagree with them and then say, you know, I, I do my own here or something like that. Um, because I think you just, again, it, it just makes for better reading if you use it. Like it is, it's, I think it's also really valuable to, um, to consult different translations um, after you've kind of come up with your own idea. But in terms of published translations of whole works, I think there are two different kinds. There's the philo philosophical kind and the sinological kind. And I think the market for sinological kind is very low, very little. Um, and so like, ultimately, I think we should probably put those online and make them free. Like, I, you know, we don't get money for them anyway. Um, this is kind of not a, not a popular view, but like, I think, you know, we should have millions and billions of footnotes, all the textual, you know, you know, variations and all these kinds of things. Like we need that, that would be good. Um, it's just we don't need that in paper. <laughs> that's that's my view, anyway. Okay, I mean, quickly, I, I want to quickly follow up. Yes, indeed, I I agree that it's uh, it's 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 actually very useful to to use uh, sort of well respected you know sort of translation. There are so many of these, especially on the uh, on the class on the classical philosophical texts, and many of them are translated multiple times. And there uh, and it's uh, I, I I use a lot of them in my uh, in my own in my own books. I don't translate uh, a lot of this, but I, I you know so but there's certain key concepts, if, especially if you want to hand your project on it, then it's important that you do a deep dive on uh, on that and, and to see what exactly is at stake. Frank, do you want to add? Yeah, I think this is, a, it's a really difficult 
the broader question is quite difficult, you know, of, of in a way, how historically accurate do the translations need to be? <laughs> you know, how much can one be doing new philosophy with the with the translation? You know, and I'm I'm not sure. I, I do think that it's a mistake, of course, to think of translations in themselves without the audience, right? I mean, so the translation, you, you know, it, you might have very different translations all equally justified depending on the audience. So how I translate Mengzi in my most recent book that's meant for a non-specialist audience is different from a, how I translate it in published papers mm -hmm. because I want it to be clearer and I want it to be more inspiring to students, you know? So I don't, I don't think it's wrong, right? But it is less precise. But on the question itself about historical versus philosophical, Certainly one aspect of it, and this is probably the philosopher's bias, but is a philosopher is going to be much more worried about the philosophical connotations of certain terms, right? So, you know, I'm doing a translation class right now. And so if somebody translates something as essence, I'm going to worry about that because that has a lot of connotations in the Western tradition, you know, or as substance. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm going to worry about that, you mm -hmm. know, whereas I think a normal reader wouldn't, right? That doesn't have that kind of loaded right. background. And you know, so they always have all different kinds of background. They might worry about it or they might they might not, you know. So I think philosophers are going to have that. On the other hand, philosophers are going to have an overall philosophical interpretation that's going to tend to skew their whole translation, right? So the translation is going to tend to be philosophically more coherent, I think, maybe, right? Because they're looking, they, because they already have kind of a strong philosophy that they're trying to express through this translation. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. We have a couple of more very specific and long questions. I guess they're all Frank's graduate students. This is an anonymous um, question uh, by, by, by an anonymous person. Were these problems between Sinology and philosophy present in the traditional Chinese academic and hermeneutic context? If so, what forms or form did they take? I ask because Sinology, quote unquote, seems to me to refer to a modern field of study influenced by Westernization. And philosophy, quote unquote, was not a recognized concept in China until the modern period. Does the modern flavor of these concepts matter? In what benefits or harms might there, have, uh, might there be in applying them to traditional Chinese text? Can I answer this question? I really love this question. <laughs> um, this kind of back and forth between really small scale, like philological work and bigger scale uh, ideas, like ideas based philosophy, basic, that's a very old problem throughout traditional scholarship. Yep. Like there's the, sometimes it expresses Han Shui versus Song Shui. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the like like philological study versus philosophy or or whatever. So there are pre-modern words for this same conflict, and it obviously takes different forms in different times. But again, like since I've been reading a lot of Zhang Shuicheng, I read Nivison's biography of Zhang Shuicheng, and mm -hmm. it looks like you know even from like you know people who talk about him and he read letters he writes and everything, he's kind of objecting to sinologists, and he's like, I want to do philosophy, and you can see that same problematic like argument go right clearly through his his writing and his kind of interactions with his peers um so so i think that's a very old kind of problem within traditional china um within textual interpretation is how how much to, and, and michael pewitt talks about this a lot actually how much do you strip back all the commentary and go back to the original source and how much do you you know, build on the com commentary tradition that's been going on since the Han, <laughs> maybe earlier, right? So it's like a cyclical process, he thinks. Dr. Professor Jiang, Frank, uh, no? I don't have anything to add to that. Yeah, okay, that's a great, great question though, whoever yes. asked that. That was anonymous. Okay, the next question is um, by Lok Chui Cho. I would like to ask a question between the distinction between a historical author and a textual author. As described by Professor Jiang, a textual author is the one who interprets in a way assuming that the text is coherent. A historical author is the one who left behind traces in historical records. However, isn't that when it comes to, uh, sorry, however, isn't that when it comes to his when it comes to historical author, we still have to take the author uh, author to be coherent uh, in, in all the historical records and that the text is also one of the historical records. 
how to really draw the distinction uh, the the line between them thanks and the question is posted let's see in the in the chat right now Okay, so so I guess the question is, uh, since you referenced uh, to my uh, to my concept, uh, I'll I'll take a stab at it. Um, so the coherence um, is really I was really talking about the sort of the inherited text, right? So the canonical text uh, that's been transmitted uh, through history. So the uh, um, the the uh, the the histor the historical author, of course, is you know a real person. Um, that has left behind uh, traces in, in various historical documents. And so, so sinologists or historians like Esther, you know, would just go through these documents very tediously and then try to tease out, you know, sort of the, uh, from various kinds of documents um, to see, well, you know, what, uh, what, uh, what kind of, you know, what kind of person this was. Um, in addition to the, the text that was uh, attributed to, to this person. Whereas the textual author, of course, is the one, when we read a text, um, when we read the text, we we work with the a sort of um, we work with the assumption that the text um, have certain kinds of coherence, especially the text that has been treated in as such within the tradition, right? So it's it's not just some random text, right? It's it's uh, these are these are uh, the kind of text that has you know really a huge weight within the tradition. And that it's, and it has been treated as coherent or as cogent, um, as if you know, even even if that might not be obvious from a more critical contemporary perspective. So so that so that that that's that's the sort of weird. It's basically talking about um, the the construction of the textual author is a way to provide a vocabulary for philosophers uh, to really to to say what exactly philosophers are doing when we address the problem of authorship. And it's, you know, since it's uh, the, uh, whereas the, the problem of historical authorship really is something that needs to be, you know, that, that needs to be addressed by historians, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that, that that's essentially the, you know, the, the, the question. So it's not a, and sometimes uh, as I put it in the book, sometimes the two, uh, co you know, overlap, right? So like uh, Sima Qian, who is the author of uh, of Shi Ji? And it's you know, as far as I know, there's you know probably no dispute about that. And then the two textual author and historical author they overlap, right? But then um, <laughs> others, other times, um, like the Dao De Jing and Lao Zi, uh, maybe there's no overlap between between them. Uh, so so then again, you know, we we're, we're talking about the the range that which is very wide. Yeah, I think we don't really bother too much to talk about historical authors in Warring States texts because it's really unknowable unless you want to say, oh, someone is the author of their speech. So like you say, like, oh, Confucius said X. And then you can say, oh, Confucius is the author of that saying, kind of to address another question that was on the thread, right? Do we have anything written by Confucius? And I think that's a very, that is not the historical authorship because people attribute all kinds of things to Confucius. It's and nobody understands it to be a literal speaking in in early times. There's a wonderful, wonderful like you know discussion about the man of Chu who lost a bow, and Confucius and he didn't want to find it. He said, "Oh, man of Chu lost it. A man of Chu will find it." And Confucius says, uh, "Take out Chu and it's good. A man lost it. A man will find it." And Lao just says, "Take out man and it's good. <laughs> like it was lost. It will be found." And like. Did anyone think that Confucius or Lao Tzu said those things? Certainly not. Like the name Confucius is standing in for something. So, you know, I think we should kind of, for Warring States, we should take the name to be standing in for something. For so much, and yes, there's controversy about whether so much wrote Shi Ji. Uh... <laughs> but I'm going to say Wang Chong wrote Lun Hung. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah, you, you historians would never let such problem go, yes. <laughs> Frank, do you want to answer? I don't have anything more to add on that. Okay, yeah. the next question, actually, I think, you know, is a spin-off of that. Um, Joseph Haroff, right? Uh, might we pragmatically move away from the very idea of a singular, unified, and authorial intent? 
right, which Dr. Klein just talked about, to a more public discourse, Yen Gong, model of conceptual production and coherence making when engaged in philosophical reconstruction of both received and excavated texts. If so, then how, how to deal with the boring, quote unquote, problem of explaining away seemingly logical inconsistencies between divergent passages. Maybe the idea of a quote unquote philosophical persona could be a useful placeholder for living issues in Chinese thought. I, I feel like I'm talking too much, but I really <laughs> love this question as well. Um, so let me have a quick stab at it. I, I think that's right. Um, I do like because I do want to treat the the warring states as kind of a yang gong type situation and one of the things that I like to do with it is to is to identify places where I think texts are talking to one another so I don't think it's boring if there's one debate and different people are weighing in on it so I think that's that's how I get around the boring problem is I say oh it's so clear that they're talking about the same issue that that so and so is arguing against somebody else and you can you can kind of if you're if you read very sensitively you can see that happening um in the sense that like i think they were all talking to each other and they weren't necessarily all reading each other but they were you know they were arguing with each other orally i think um and so there are traces of that in texts and then you're right i totally use the name uh you know zhuangzi or something or or xunzi to stand in for the perspective that you now find in their text. And I feel that that's, you know, I'm okay with that. Like, I feel comfortable with that. Maybe some other sinologists wouldn't, but. Anyone? Professor Jiang? Frank? No? Um, I, it's, it is a very interesting question. I mean, in a way, I wonder if that would be kind of taking the function of the textual author, but making it much more flexible, like not tying it to a text anymore, right? So it's a kind of projected author, but in in much smaller bits or like in lots of different kinds of ways. I do think the problem, I, I agree with Tao that there should be some push toward unification generally for it to be interesting. I mean, I do, I also agree with Esther that it's interesting to find them talking to each other. And that is actually how more often how I, I tend to read the text. But I still think that for what each side is saying to be significant, there needs to be enough to it. And that requires often, I think, reading things, trying to figure out how they fit together, even if they seem like they don't fit together. I think the other problem there is one that I think Tao was maybe pointing to in his comments, which is the problem of arbitrariness. So it's one thing to say, you know, we don't know what kind of unity a text has. But then once you start to say, so, okay, I'm going to break it up into these five parts. And someone else is going to say, I'm going to break it into these five parts. And we have very little basis for how to break that down. I think I, that is a worry about it. On the other hand, I think there's an arbitrariness if we read them as saying as coherent, because you've got to pick which of the things you're going to take as the central thing and which is the thing that doesn't really say what it seems to say. You know, there's arbitrariness in any approach on it. But I think the question of sort of what would be the boundary of this philosophical persona and you know how arbitrary is that boundary that would be the difficult question with it i do think it's like the, the probably the most promising way of of trying to approach it from my perspective but i do think there's difficulties with this where's the boundaries of that persona i guess is the question i think i think the the the, the question of the arbitrariness is 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 really is is really actually an important one right it's you know sort of the the, the tradition you know presents the you know the the, the canonical Sort of kind of the history, and it's you know has its own arbitrariness, and and then break, breaking it, you know, and however we divide it, in, in it has you know has its own risk. But I think it's I'm almost willing to to grant people that it's you know show me what um what you can do with you know let's break it up and then say whether well, this is actually produce something that's more interesting, uh, that's more revealing, and sure, that's I'm all for it. So I wouldn't a priori close it or you know or embrace it i want to see what what can be done what people use this whatever it is that they work on the sort of authorship or or textual divisions um and show me what you know what is uh interesting and different uh, and revealing about that and then uh then i can then judge whether that's something that's worth it or not Okay, we only have four minutes left and we have three more questions, but I just want to take this question because it's actually a good way to conclude this session because I think maybe one, each of you can answer that with one sentence. And this is from 
um, uh, Raluca G. Focusing strictly on the main title of this talk, How to Read Ancient Chinese Philosophy, as someone who would be reading these texts without anticipating any of the ideas within them or from commentary tradition, I ask, how to read ancient Chinese philosophy? I think you should read what appeals to you in the way that it appeals to you, and that's the way to start. <laughs> Right? What What is meaningful for your life? Because I think ancient Chinese philosophy is really trying to be meaningful to you for your life. Right. I think reading it, it's not a one off uh, kind of situation. It's a repeated reading. And, you know, and then you what, what when you first read it, um, um, it's it's hard to find point of you know of entry because you know some of it is just random. It's you know, it's it might be you know it's not it's not the most systematic of text and and uh, there are lots of you know other kinds of you know linguistic and and other kinds of challenges. And I think it's you know there's there's no way you can just read like Analex once and then boom you get all of it or Drones once and you get all of it. Uh, you 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 read you read um, Drones whatever that interests you as uh, Esther said you know whatever that interests you then you dive into it. And and then you read others, and then you and then you refer back, and then you start to see connections uh, between them, and then they will be become mutually uh, sort of you know mutually enlightening, right? They will become mutually revealing, and uh, and then you start to sort of see the broader and broader and broader kind of um, sort of horizon and broader kind of connections, and you start to see a, a general more general kind of picture rather than sort of just be narrowly focusing on the particular kinds of text. Then you end up just Re entering into kind of intertextuality of the ancient uh, Chinese class, you know, text, and I think that for me is a very sort of useful way of uh, of approaching it. I would say starting if you're really starting from scratch, it's very difficult to appreciate any of these texts just read on their own. So you might read, you know, some to Zhuangzi, you know, read the Tao Te Ching, but read, you know, find sources where people are talking about them. You know, and I think it's almost necessary to have some guidance in approaching a lot of these texts, but try to find someone who is a scholar, right? I mean, there's a lot, especially on the Tao Te Ching, really unreliable things. And keep in mind that these can be read in lots of different ways, right? So you're reading one take on the text and not the take on the text, but it is very difficult. I, I've, in my Mencius book, I comment that part of my reason for writing it was I thought there's a lot to learn from Mencius. And I thought, I just can't tell people to go read Mencius. You know, I mean, like it's just too hard to appreciate it. It's too hard to make sense of it. You need some orientation, you know, I think. And then, I mean, I think you should read the text at the same time, you know, but but I really do feel like you need some orientation to be able to figure out what's even interesting in most of the text. So I think bits of the Zhuangzi will be, you know, you can read and, and appreciate pretty quickly. And and maybe the Lao Tzu also, you know, is so open to interpretation that everybody reads it and finds something interesting in it, you know. But to 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 use sources, but but be very aware that there's so many ways of reading the texts. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we run out of time. Right? I want to thank all three of you uh, for this very fascinating, illuminating, and informative dialogue. And I want to thank the audience for submitting all these interesting questions. We're going to share all that with our speakers. And I apologize to two people, two questions that we were not able to answer. But I assure you that our speakers will receive a copy of all of your questions. And maybe you can email them and engage with them individually after that. So thank you very much for joining us. And please uh, remember next week we have another CCS webinar focusing a uh, book launch that will